And the reason I like to praise God is because it, it guarantees his presence. You know, I used to think that my praise took me to God, but I learned that when I praise, my praises brings God to me because God inhabits the praise of his people. So if you don't mind, let's just give God a hand praise as the praise team comes. Every praise belongs to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's praise God together. Clap your hands. Yeah. Oh, every praise. Every praise. To our God, every word of worship, every word of worship, one accord, one accord, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, to our God, to our God, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, to our God, to our God, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, to our God. It's to our Oh, one of oh, oh, every pray, every pray, every pray, every pray, every pray to our God. To our God. Oh, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. To our God. Yes, he is. Yes, he 
Hallelujah. How many people love to praise God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Glory to God. Find favor in your sight, Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting to be where you I cross the hottest desert, Lord, I travel near all far for your glory. I will do anything just to see. You as my king for your glory, Lord. I will do anything just to see you, to behold you, to behold you as my king, Lord, if I. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, Lord, Lord, won't you hear? Oh, I'm desperately, desperately waiting. I wanna be, I gotta be where you. I want you to be whole. Where? Oh, I 
do anything I just want to see you to behold you as my king I want to be where you are I gotta be where you are said I want to be where you are Lord I gotta be where you are cause peace is where you are joy is where you to be I just want to be Lord wherever you are oh it's wherever you are oh I want to be where you are hallelujah thank you God
think I just heard a sermon already this morning. But I know for sure that this is the day that God has made. If you would, if you would indulge me this morning, if you would just stand, I want us to welcome one another. We have welcomed God into this space. God is here. But I also want us to recognize that God is with you. And God is within me. So if you will put your hands together in front of you, turn to the person to your left and to your right, and say, the God in me sees the God in you. The God in me sees the God in you. For our siblings who are online, the God in me sees the God who is in you. Amir, God sees you. Tracy, God sees you. Christopher, God sees you. Shelly, God sees you. The God in me sees the God in you. You may be seated this morning. I'm so excited and honored and privileged to be before you this morning. I'm Reverend Dr. Sonia Williams. I am the Dean. I'm the Dean of the Seminary and Assistant Professor of Practical Theology. On behalf of the President, Dr. Deborah Krauss, faculty and staff, I am honored to welcome you to Eden Theological Seminary Spring Convocation Closing Worship. For the last few days, we have had the opportunity to learn from one another and to journey with Reverend Dr. Damianti Niles, Professor of Constructive Theology. Yes. <clears throat> Who is also the Allen and Dottie Miller Professor of Mission and Peace. Today, we continue our travels and reflect on our baptism through a vision of decolonizing Christianity with an eye towards pluralism. It is also my honor to welcome to the pulpit in just a little while, our preacher for the day and the recipient of this year's Senior Preacher Award, Dr. Priscilla Dowden White. She is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. She holds a BA in history from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and an MPS in Africana studies from Cornell University, a PhD in history from Indiana University, Bloomington, and will soon hold a Master's of Divinity from Eden Theological <laughs> Seminary. She is the author of Roping Towards Democracy, African-American Social Welfare Reform in St. Louis, 1910 to 1949. If you want to look that up, that's University of Missouri Press. A member of St. James AME Church in St. Louis, Priscilla is currently serves as supply pastor of Bethel AME and is licensed in the AME Church. She is pursuing an itinerant orders and anticipates being ordained at the Missouri Annual Conference of the AME Church in October of this year. Y'all clap before I ask, so we gotta do it again. <laughs> Together, may we recognize this year's seniors preacher, Dr. Priscilla Dowden White, and welcome the spirit of the holy into this sacred space. To God be the glory. everyone. I will be praying uh, this morning according to my uh, Trish, Christian faith, and uh, I invite each and every one of you to join in in your respective ways. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we come to you this morning just thanking you for this day, for this is the day that the Lord has made. God, we give you praise in this place because you are Abba Father. 
We thank you right now for being the maker, the creator, the source of all life and all strength. We thank you for raining down on us today. We invite your presence in this sanctuary, for in your presence is the fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures evermore. God, we give you praise today that out of our bellies are flowing rivers of living water. We thank you, God, that the word that's coming forth, that it shall come forth and fall on good ground, ground that shall bring forth a harvest that shall remain. I thank you for every family that's represented, every household, oh God, every community leader. I thank you, oh God, for your word in the name of Jesus. We thank you, oh God, for the blood of Jesus. It is the blood that heals us. It is the blood that cleanses us. It is the blood that redeemed us. And for that, we give you praise, oh God. Have your way in this place. Rain down on us. Shine your light down from heaven upon us. Remove everything that's not like you. And God, I lift the speaker up before you right now in the name of Jesus, that you will speak through her, oh God, with boldness, the anointing, and with clarity. It is the anointing that destroy the yoke, oh God. And for that, we give you praise. We give you glory, and I give you honor in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together, So 
let your praise resound in this room. Hallelujah. Today, Bible scripture is taken from Holy Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. I ask, not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, father and mother of all, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, the glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you are in me. That they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Truly parent, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous parent, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with the, which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Okay, what the Spirit is saying to the church.
really need to This is the second time that I have stood behind this sacred desk this academic year. And the first time I thought I was gonna faint. This time is no different. I'm gonna ask that you pray with me, pray for me. Oh, most gracious God, Lord God, we just thank you for your presence. We feel your presence, Lord God, enveloping us, Lord God, running through us, Lord God, throughout this sacred space, Lord God, and for that we say thank you. Lord God, now we ask that you continue to speak because you've already spoken in this service. Continue to speak, O oh Lord. Lord God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thine sight, O oh Lord. You are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You know, I really don't have the words to express how overwhelmed with gratitude, with thanksgiving, I am for receiving this year's Senior Preacher Award. I'm always amazed at what God is doing in my life and in the lives of others. The words thank you seem inadequate to express my gratitude to the faculty for the trust that you have put in me to serve as God's vessel for this blessed occasion. Upon learning that I had received this year's honor, it didn't take long for a sense of fear and trepidation to set in as I thought about the weightiness of the task before me. My daughter, Dara, our daughter, Dara, that's my husband there, Christopher. <laughs> she often serves as my you can do this mom cheerleader. And when I told her about this honor, and what I was feeling, my nervousness. She said, mom, just treat it like any other sermon. And I tried to explain, but Dara, this isn't any other sermon. And she said, mom, you always take preaching seriously. And so this time should be no different. She said, do what you always do in preparation to preach and you'll be fine. And that's what I have done. I immediately began praying about this year's first iteration um, of a convocation theme, which was Christian participation in an interfaith world. I prayed and I waited, I waited and I prayed. I began to look back over materials from courses I have taken over the past four years here at Eden. Among these courses, most recently, I went back to 
some of what I had studied in my evangelism course and some of what I had studied in a course called Christianity and the American Nation. I looked back at notes and resources from my social ethics and Christian faith course. And I did some additional reading and studying in my attempt to open myself up for receiving a word from the Lord for you and for me. I don't remember exactly when the final six verses of Jesus' farewell discourse entered my spirit. This farewell discourse that is also sometimes referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. While the text immediately spoke to me, spoke to my spirit, it was far from immediately apparent to me just how this text relates to Christian witness in an interfaith world. I continued to go before the Lord to open myself up, to receive. I went to a couple of my preaching partners to, to share and to reflect. And God continued to send revelation after revelation to confirm that this was the word of the Lord for such a time as this. I even went back to God and said, God, you know there's been a refinement in the theme. Uh, it's now pluralism a vision for decolonizing Christianity. And I said, I, I even heard that there's a, a little concern that's been expressed to make sure that I understand that we've moved beyond unity to decolonizing. I said, God, I, I'm sorry, but I think I miscommunicated this assignment <laughs> to you. Have you ever had God to laugh at you? I, 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 I've had God to laugh at me on several occasions. And, and I felt God laughing at me and we were laughing together. It wasn't a condescending laugh. It was that laugh that, that says, um, daughter, in a loving way, that says, son, I understood the assignment before it was given to you. And then the spirit of the living God said, don't you know that we can unify and decolonize at the same time? I'm not a dualistic God. As I continued to lean into this word, I remained somewhat troubled by the text. I looked at it in several, several versions and they all said the same thing. They had Jesus praying to his father in the text. And of course, here at Eden, we are taught, uh, I'll go a little further, we're commanded to use inclusive language, which of course is an act of love. Our attempt at more inclusive language recognizes the historical role of patriarchy in the society and the subsequent need to decolonize our language, including the patriarchal language that is found in the biblical text. I wrestled with this. I'm still wrestling with this. I've been wrestling with it for four years. And the Supreme Spirit spoke to me and said, continue to wrestle with it because humankind does not and will not have the language to adequately define or describe me, the one to whom Jesus is praying. The spirit said, remember how I responded to Job out of the whirlwind when I asked, where were you? when I laid the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Uh, uh, who stretched 
the line upon it on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. And then remember how Elohim spoke to Job. He said, surely God is great. And we do not know God. The number of God's years is unsearchable. This is the God to whom Jesus prays in our text, the God whose years, the number of years is unsearchable. Scientists estimate that the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old, give or take 4 million. The creator of the universe is the one to whom Jesus prays. This is the God of whom the Psalmist David praised and saying, you have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you can care for them. Yet you have made them just a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yes, this is the one to whom Jesus is praying. This Jesus, this first and cosmic incarnation of the eternal Christ, the perfect co in Parents of matter and spirit, it tells us in Ephesians 1, 3 through 11, happening at the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, give and take, give or take 4 million years. Christians believe that Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, born in Nazareth was the human incarnation of that same mystery a mere 2000 years ago. As the Franciscan mystic Richard Rohr says, when we were perhaps ready to receive the revelation. Rohr observes how Trinitarian theology, he says, offers us perhaps the best foundation for true interfaith dialogue and friendship. Because now Christians don't have Jesus as our primary or only trump card. This makes mutual respect and intelligent dialogue with other religions easier and much more natural. Up to now, we've generally used Jesus in a competitive way instead of in a cosmic way. And thus others hear our Christian gospel at a tribal, a come join us or else level. This is a far cry from the universal Christ of Colossians who reconciles all things unto God's self in heaven and on earth. In short, we have made Jesus Christ into an exclusive savior instead of the totally inclusive savior he was meant to be. As the pastor and author Brian McLaurin uh, put it, Jesus is the way, he's not in the way. In the prologue to John's gospel, John puts it this way, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him and without him, not one single thing came into being. What has come into being in him, was life and the life was the light of all people. 
The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And this God, this Jesus, this Jesus who was in the beginning is the one who is praying not only for his disciples, but for those who will believe in him through the witness of his disciples, that they shall come to grasp that the glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays for our unity, that we may all be one. It is a unity that is not rooted in sameness or uniformity. The uniqueness of the individual is not lost in this relationship. So, is, so it is also with God's church. It is a unity, a oneness rooted in the very being of God. As you, God, am in me, and I am in you, so they may also be in us. So that the way in which you have loved me will be with them as well. So this is the unity rooted not in agreement, but in something much more profound, a unity rooted in oneness is a, a, a unity rooted in love. How do we as individuals, as a Christian community, as the broader body of Christ, bear witness to the unity of God in the way that we live out our mission and the witness in the world? How might our unity as a church bear witness to the glory of Jesus, the lifting up of our eyes to the glory of God, the goodness of God? Essentially, how do we live into this oneness, this unity? Today, I'm only going to talk with us about one way and it's already almost 1230 and mind you I didn't get up here until after 1215 so I'm taking back my time I'm reclaiming my time as I prepared for this sermon the spirit brought back to my remembrance something I read back in 20. 16, two years before I began seminary. That year, Michelle Alexander, the author of the critically acclaimed and award-winning book titled The New Jim Crow, left her career as a law professor to immerse herself in seminary studies and teaching. I was struck by what Alexander said about the reason for her decision. And I'd like to share that reason with you in her own words. She said, I am walking away from the law. I've resigned my position as a law professor at Ohio State University and I've decided to teach and study at a seminary. Why? There is no easy answer to this question and there are times I worry that I have completely lost my mind. I, I feel that way sometimes too. Who am I to teach or study at a seminary? I was not raised in the church and I have generally found more questions than answers 
in my own religious or spiritual pursuits. She says, but I also know there is something much greater at stake in justice work than we often acknowledge. Solving the crises we face isn't simply a matter of having the right facts, the right graphs, policy analysis, or funding. And I no longer believe that we can win justice simply by filing lawsuits, flexing our political muscles. We need a word from the Lord. <laughs> or by boosting voter turnout. Yes, we absolutely must do that work, but none of it, not even working for some form of political revolution will ever be enough on its own. Without a moral or spiritual awakening, we will remain forever trapped in political games fueled by war, greed, and the hunger for power. American history teaches how these games predictably play out within our borders. Time and time again, race gets used as the trump card, a reliable means of dividing, controlling, and misleading the players so, off, so a few can win the game. This is not simply a legal problem or a political problem or a policy problem. At its core, America's journey from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration raises profound moral and spiritual questions about who we are individually and collectively, who we aim to become and what we are willing to do now. The prophetic calls us to reflect on and give voice to our relationship with God and our relationships with other people, with culture and with the systems and structures of our society. Priests, on the other hand, help us with our relationship with God. I don't know if Alexander had in mind the implications of her profound observation for reflecting on, reflecting on our prophetic and our priestly callings. But the implications are plain for us to see. Along with our social justice work, operating through our social justice work laying the foundation for our social justice work must be the priestly work. What are those who are victimized, shackled and imprisoned by the demoralizing systems, structures and culture of our society to do while they wait for our social justice work to manifest? What are they going to do? What is going to enable them to hold on and hold out? To hold on until they receive a respectable living wage to adequately sustain themselves and their families. A respectable living wage that in their lifetime, they may never see. What's going to allow them to hold on into our, our social justice work, find success in reforming our criminal justice system. What's going to allow those who have been victimized, shackled and imprisoned by the demoralizing systems, structures and culture of our society to hold on, to hold out, until we find a way to end our penchant for war. What's going to enable them to hold on until everyone has adequate health care, 
access and resources. What's going to allow them to hold on until we can shut down the school to prison pipeline and annihilate the prison industrial complex? How are those who are discriminated against because of their gender, all genders, going to hold on until they feel completely seen and viewed as your creation, God? How are they going to hold on until our justice system can undo generational legacies of slavery and racial segregation? How are they gonna hold on and hold out until our social justice results in humane immigration laws? How are they going to hold on until there's no more food insecurity? How are they going to hold on until all lives really matter? How are they going to hold on when just the daily pressures of life, even for those who are not victimized, shackled by these systems, just attempt to deal with life. How are, are they going to hold on? For this is the priestly work of our callings. We see it right here in Jesus' high priestly prayer. His prayer conveys first that we as followers of Jesus, as his disciples know that we are one and that as we are in, not with, but in the one who more than 13.8 billion years ago, give or take 4 million, is in me, the cosmic Christ, the universal Christ, and I am in you. And then we go out Jesus tells us, we see it in the text, you go out and you be a witness, a witness to the way that you carry in the way that you carry out social justice, which is the gospel, a witness in the way that we carry out the priestly callings of pastoral care and evangelism. It was a Monday of this week that I heard Reverend Tracy Blackman on a panel say that she is currently struggling with this demarcation that we have placed between the priestly and the prophetic work of our callings. Jesus says, you tell them about the God of salvation. That's the God of freedom and deliverance. You tell them that this is the God of Paul and Silas, who one day the scriptures in the book of Acts chapter 16 tells us that they found themselves in prison, beaten black and blue on some trumped up charges. And because Paul and Silas understood that they were one in this same God that I'm preaching about today, that Jesus is praying to on behalf of his disciples and those who would believe, whose years are unsearchable. The Bible says that during the night, these two men were singing hymns and praying when a severe earthquake rocked the prison and all the prison doors flew open and the chains fell off of all of the prisoners. Not some, but fell off of all of the prisoners. When the jailer realized this, the jailer was about to kill himself rather than wait for the authorities to punish him. You know, I got to that part in the scripture and when I read it this time, it took on a particular 
completely new meaning for me because this year, this within the past 12 months, my husband and I have lost three members of our family to suicide. Two under 30 and one 15. And the scripture says that the jailer realizing this, he was about to kill himself rather than to wait for the authorities to punish him as he expected that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, it's all right, we're still here. Paul and Silas knew that they had freedom in Jesus a freedom in the cosmic Christ who was in God, the creator prior to being beaten and imprisoned in the empire's prison. Awestruck the jailer as Paul and, Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Then Paul taught the jailer and all in his household about this Jesus and about his love, all of them were baptized as soon as the jailer had cared for the two men's wounds. And I like how this text gives us a clear illustration of how the priestly calling works hand in hand with the prophetic calling. For around verse 35, it says that Daybreak, the court judges sent officers with instructions, release these men. The jailer gave Paul the message. The judges sent word that you're free to go on your way. Congratulations, go in peace. But Paul wouldn't budge. He told the officers, they beat us up in public and they threw us in jail. Roman citizens in good standing. And now they want to get us out of the way on their slide, on the slide without anyone knowing, nothing doing. If they want us out of here, let them come themselves and lead us out in broad daylight. Paul was evangelizing at the same time while he protested the system. The final thing I'd like to leave you with my friends is that the work of witness is not work that we can do alone. In our witness and work on behalf of this God to whom Jesus is praying, we as a Christian community should understand that God has not given us this work and this witness alone to do by ourselves. I'm reminded of um, something that happened about four years ago with our grandchildren. Our grandchildren love hotels and they had gone on a vacation with their parents and their paternal grandparents and an aunt. And they were staying in, um, a, a, a really large suite with several rooms. And some of the adults had gone out. Uh, their grandmother and aunt had stayed behind with them. And at that time, Kevin, uh, the oldest, was six and Caleb was four. And my um, in-laws said that they had actually started dozing off to sleep. And all of a sudden, they awakened to a knock on the door and a small voice saying, I could use a little help. So did you hear that? I I could use a little help. And they looked around, they jumped up and they went in the other room, where's Kevin and Caleb? And then the knock was louder and the voice was a, a little louder. I can use a little help. And they opened the door and there was Kevin and Caleb. 
And I love this story. When I first heard it, it spoke to my spirit because that's the way God speaks to me. I don't know about you, but God has never spoken to me in a James Earl Jones, Charlton Heston voice. God speaks to me in that still small voice. And, and God is, is saying to us, I, I can use a little help. You can't do this by your own. You are in me and I am in you. Um, and I could use a little help. And so if we as a Christian community take this perspective and learn to recognize that the cosmic Christ is that original metaphysical identity of the second person of the Trinity, an identity much larger that includes but is much larger than the historical Jesus. Then Jewish people, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and spiritual but not religious people have no reason to fear us nor we of them. And we can nourish a dialogue and nourish the work of God. They can easily recognize that the cosmic Christ includes and honors all of creation, including themselves, including us from the beginning of time. And only then can our witness be a witness of love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Dowden White, for that good word. Amen. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Shelby Henry and the band uh, for being here today. What a blessing for us here. We appreciate you being here. Friends, Agrippa Ndatila is an Eden graduate ordained in the Anglican Church of Tanzania, now serving as the principal of St. Philip's Theological College in Kongwa, Tanzania. When he was a student, anybody here when he was a student? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, oh, I know him. When he was a student here at Eden, he described for me the methods of proselytizing used by the missionaries in Tanzania. He said they didn't come in to the villages and join the villages. They, they didn't come in and become a part of the community and invest themselves in the community. He said they came and they built a compound outside the community. A mission, right? Then they would begin to invite villagers to come out and join them to convert to Christianity and to live with them in the missionary compound outside the village. Baptism then was an invitation to come away and be separate. It meant renouncing one's name for a biblical name, which we know now was a Western anglicized version of a biblical name, right? It meant giving up one's traditional clothing for more modest clothing, which of course meant dressing like the missionaries themselves in Western clothing, often unsuitable for the climate. Right? We heard that from Dory earlier. 
In other words, dressing just like the missionaries did. It meant learning English, which somehow became the language of faith. And it meant literally leaving home and going to live outside of one's culture and community, returning primarily to bring others away. So, for many people in Tanzania, baptism meant dying to their traditions, the faith of their upbringing, their ancestors, dying even to their families. It meant washing away their identity and the richness of their culture. Baptism itself became a colonizing process. Our event yesterday began talking about the use of the cross as a colonizing instrument. And here we have an example of baptism as a colonizing process. So today, we are going to invite you to remember your baptism in a new way. And we may have to share some of these hand towels um, just because of the number of them. We invite you to remember your baptism not as an act that offered you a single cultural paradigm, but rather as an act that offered you freedom in Christ and an invitation to a broader conversation. Come, come to the water, come and wash away oppressive behaviors and the false choice between the mission compound and community. Come wash away and see your privileges that lead to generational trauma. Mm. Come wash away oppressive and colonizing beliefs we hold as true and force upon others. And may we come and remember the particularities, the streams of culture and wisdom passed on to you by your ancestors. Mm. Even as you rejoice in the message of your sacred text, come and pass through the waters of the Exodus, the waters of liberation, mm. and claim the goodness of exactly how you were created. This is my child, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. So now, if you like, if you, you are welcome and you are welcome and you are welcome to come forward, to have water poured on your hands. For some of us, it is a chance to stir up new memories, being claimed for who we are. For others, it is an opportunity to be baptized in the Jordan of polarity. Come and remember your baptism and be thankful. I invite you to come forward, simply hold hands and they'll pour water over your hands. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Use one of those hand towels to dry off if you want. If the hand towel gets kind of used up, you can just put it in the basket underneath. And I was going to sing a different song, but given the sermon, um, if you want to, if you know this and you want to sing it along as we're coming forward, I welcome you to do that. All I'm silence bound in jail. Didn't have money for to pay the bill. Keep your eyes on the prize. Oh, 
the God of all creation, the one who breathed life into every living being, the creator of the universe, more than 13.8 billion years ago, give or take four million. May that God, may you be in that God and that God in you. And may we be connected to one another in our witness. Amen, amen, amen.